who is Professor of Medical Humanities at Durham University in the UK and Deputy Vice Provost for Research. Until 2021, she was Director of the University's Institute for Medical Humanities, where she led a project that I was on called Life of Breath. Um, and I might say, um, one cannot overstate the significance that Jane McNaughton has had in medical humanities in the UK. She is clinically qualified as well, and has until recently been regularly clinically active as an honorary consultant in obstetrics and gynecology at the University Hospital of North Durham. And uh, her most recent book is The Life of Breath in Literature, Cultures and Medicine, co-edited with Corinne Saunders and David Fuller. Jay. Right. Thanks, Arthur. It's, um, it's really fantastic to be here after all these delays and, and intrusions. And also, um, this is the first international conference I've been to since the start of the lockdown. And it is extraordinary. Um, getting back into this space of kind of discussion and uh, and the liveliness of it all. It, it, on the one hand, it's quite exhausting. On the other hand, it's extraordinary, energizing. So I'm really grateful to, to, to Luna and the rest of the team for this invitation, this opportunity to be in this fantastic city, which I love so much actually, and any opportunity is just brilliant. Um, it's uh, There's been a rich set of, of conversations and, you know, I'm slightly nervous to be following on from our, our previous quite theoretical um, uh, approach um, because my I think what I'm going to be talking about is very much located partly in, in clinical practice, partly in sort of experiences, historical context. So a, a rather different perhaps um, approach to, to what, we've been, what we've been having across the different perspectives we already had. I did wonder about talking about the breath, the Life of Breath project that Arthur uh, mentioned which like this one was a welcome funded project looking at the experience of breathlessness because the people we work with there really did suffer quite significantly from shame on account of the symptom that they um, experienced because there's been the stigma associated with that because of its association with smoking, not looking after yourself. Um, and people really, um, the, the notion when we start to talk in relation to associations with Luna's project about the idea of this being shameful rather than stigmatized, which is a slightly more sort of clinically orientated concept that really chimed with them in a major way and made them feel, yes, that's really what we feel, but very um, upsetting to think of that. Um, but today I wanted to give myself the opportunity to think more about my own clinical field. As Arthur mentioned, I've worked in the field of, of women's health until fairly recently. When I got the new job, it became impossible to continue to do that. Um, and um, what I've what my, my, my most recent work, I was a GP for a few years, but also um, more recently I worked in um, in women's health as a colposcopist, which is the examination you have if your smear is abnormal for women in the audience who may know about that. Um, and I'm going to link, I'm going to link that experience with my sort of emergent interest in the field of the menopause, which is a field of, of work that I'd been intending to really develop a large project on until COVID started and other um, ex other uh, responsibilities started to take take out. So. Um, just, um, I was very taken by Luna's um, definition of shame highlighted at the conference in Exeter at the outset of the project. And that's key to some of the thinking that I'm uh, being, uh, is this gonna move on? Is that, oh, wait a minute. Uh, has it got stuck? Great. So I just, if I can yeah. do that. Yeah, brilliant. That's it. So um, yes, this is Luna's, uh, uh, which I'm sure you're all well, 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 and it's been raised uh, today. When we're, shame arises when we're concerned about how we are seen and judged by others, present or imagined to be flawed, when part of our core self is perceived to be inadequate, inappropriate, or immoral. So some of the things I'll say, I think, will pick out perhaps some of the sort of deep-seated historical cultural reasons why women may feel this way about their bodies in relation to reproductive health. But turning first, I think, to my uh, experience as a practitioner, um, well, this is the examination that I undertake, um, colpo colposcopy, quite an invasive procedure with a woman lying on her back, um, uh, legs wide open, 
um, exposing the most private area of the body to a closely examining eye. And it involves instrumentation, which can be pretty frightening looking. And there's obvious ways in which this examination is fraught with shame, it's intimate, these private areas of the body being exposed right up front. Um, and um, there are straightforward issues of shame at having a problem related to a hidden and private part of the body. But there's also a problem of it being um, dirty in comparison to other problems. It, it, in coposcopy, obviously, what we're doing is we're screening for cervical early um, cervical precancer. So there's an association of, of that. But um, women have, have described how um, the, the cancer associated with these reproductive areas is in some sense dirtier than cancers elsewhere. Here's a quote from one woman saying um, in, in a cancer group that um, she uh, felt uh, embarrassed to talk about the fact she had vulval cancer rather than cancer from other, other areas, that cancer of the sexual organs is, is more shameful. And other complex areas are that um, there's a lack of language for referring to the different parts of the reproductive system. There's confusion about where the problem is. I've often had to delve deeper to find out what part of the reproductive system the patient was referring to in her family history, and it's not uncommon for people not to know or be rather evasive about where the problem is. And, and I think we've often, clinicians will tend sometimes to not to delve too much for fear of compounding this sense of shame and embarrassment. Um, we don't tend to ask about women's relationships or sexual history in cervical cancer uh, screening, although there's, it's clear that there's a relationship between early age at first intercourse, multiple partners with an increased risk of cervical cancer. And there's an interesting, um, I think, pattern to referrals um, in, in the clinic I, I worked in. Peaks amongst women in their, in their mid-20s and again in later uh, 40s and 50s. And one such older woman came in and it was clear she was particularly uncomfortable and ashamed, but also angry. As is so often in the pattern in these cases, this woman's marriage had broken up after her children had left and she developed pre-cancer from a new relationship with somebody who'd also been unfaithful and she'd uncovered all this because of the, the problem uh, on her body. And in gently probing about this, I felt I might help her to understand why this had happened, but I felt, I felt ashamed that in questioning her, I had to help her to face something that was really embarrassing and difficult for her to face. Um, but there's also, I think, a surprisingly caring approach to, from patients towards clinicians that in a sense it's shameful for me as a doctor to have to examine down there. I notice that women often make quite um, complex preparations for the clinic visit, including shaving their vulval areas, shaving their legs, very carefully douching. I never ever examine a woman where there's, you know, it's dirty looking or smelly or anything like that. Women are very, very careful about that kind of thing in order to try to preserve some sense of dignity here. Um, and in parallel, I think, with this experience, um, research suggests that shame and difficulty is also experienced by doctors who are more comfortable dealing with the straightforward technical aspects of a consultation rather than some of these um, difficult areas, particularly in relation to, 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 to sexual activity. And I think this chimes with some of the stuff that we heard yesterday about, about, about doctors being unable perhaps to enter into these kinds of conversations. And just quoting, I mean, I did, I did speak to this at the last conference, a little bit. This paper by White, um, we're looking at women's perceptions and experience of their sexual lives following gynecological cancer treatment. And they argue that a narrow biomedical gaze excludes exploration of the subjective experience, which is central to understanding women's sexual recovery post-treatment. And their interviews with women revealed that clinicians reasonably focus on ensuring that there's no cancer recurrence but shout out other concerns. So for example, um, a, a male registrar, registrar um, who was seeing a, a woman um, said, I examined a lady vaginally and she bled. She hadn't bled before. First thing that goes through my mind is, couldn't feel anything, but was this a, a relapse? And in that sort of context, you may suddenly find that in that consultation, no matter how much time there is, there isn't room for discussing other issues. 
And there's an avoidance of the issue, focusing on things that are more clearly clinical. So a patient talking to a, a, a the radiotherapy nurse, um, this radiotherapy nurse, her way of coping with that, talking about sex, was not by having eye contact. She was very much on the medical side. She says, oh, yes, you can have sex, enjoy it, that's fine, but still no eye contact, no sense of engaging with this, with this issue, trying to get a way back to the clinical interactions. So I think others in the conference, we've already talked a bit about the, about the clinical uh, perspective here. And I want to focus more on being a woman in this context rather than the experience of a clinician. And specifically, I think the shame of being a woman whose sexual activity becomes written on the body. Um, and I think that's really quite a feature in, in this field. And I, 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 reading Luna's book that brought me to, to, to um, Amor McBride's book, Something out of place. No, sorry, this was the most, this is a very recent book. It, it was uh, Luna's book took me to something else, but Emma McBride has just written this book, Something Out of Place, Women and Disgust, which I'm sure a few of you are aware of. And it speaks, speaks of shame being the default setting for women uh, drunk in with mother's milk. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and it's often hard to differentiate where shame and authentic sense of self begin she says. And Luna, in her book, the, the Body and Shame, discussing Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, notes that becoming a woman is essentially an extended lesson in shame. The process of adolescence of breast development, menstruation, the changing and filling out of the body shape, um, emphasize that sense of, of you know, that you're beginning to be perhaps noticed for things that feel shameful and difficult. It's the start of a woman's career of being noticed for her body, for unsolicited comment, for the apparent imperative to respond to the gaze of the other by various approaches to body management through dress, makeup, and even the extent of bodily enhancement through surgery in some cases. So it's really, it's beyond the scope of my current expertise to delve into the subject as a woman's embodiment um, and this has been well explored by Luna and other writers such as Erica Johnson and Patricia Moran. But some issues are important to highlight in the context of reproductive health. Luna comments on the feminist critique of Merleau Ponty, Sartre and Foucault for a male orientated bias in their work. The male body is regarded as the standard or neutral form mirroring medical standardization of the so-called 70 kilogram man that we all learned about as medical students. It was the kind of standard thing um, against which all results are measured. And as such, women's bodies by default become something different. And as Luna um, says in her uh, book, um, inevitable events in female embodiment, such as pregnancy, menstruation, and menopause, are positioned as anomalies of normal experience, which are not only stigmatized, but also pathologized, requiring professional medical attention, traditionally from male doctors. And this pathologization is compounded by the fact that women's sexual activity brings them to the attention of doctors and the medical profession much more often than men. For example, women are part of the screening prog program for cervical cancer, which is what, what I've been working in, that looks for cellular changes caused by human papillomavirus, which is a sexually transmitted infection. And I've sometimes been asked by women in the clinic who project a slight sense of resentment, whether there are any consequences for men um, of infection with HPV in the same way as for women. And there is, as yet, no screening process for men who may develop anal cancer um, or penile cancer as a result of sexual activity. These are rarer and much more difficult to treat, so they don't become part of that structured uh, um, review. Um, but the problem for women feel that by being sexually active, they of necessity become more visible, as it were, and, and suffer the shame of being caught in the act in a sense. There's a clear mismatch here, I think, between men and women. Traditionally, men are valued, from, are valued for their sexual prowess, um, whereas women are regarded as sluts, as immoral, um, as something um, written and sung about by the great Dolly Parton here in her uh, song, Just Because I'm a Woman. Um, uh, she's very aware of it. There's been much contemporary pushback against these double standards. And it's interesting how we had a bit of a sense of this 
yesterday with um, Phil's discussion of Matthew Hodgson uh, HIV um, tweets. So we've had things like the slut walk, for example, um, you know, taking ownership of that shamed notion. Um, so medicine, I think, um, has added to this to toxicity through its technologies and its ways of defining and understanding reproductive health. When I first started my clinical work in colposcopy, the problem was not defined as an infection with HPV, as an STI, but rather as abnormal cells on the cervix. But over the last 15 years or so, that has changed and our script in the clinic has changed with the need to explain the origins of these abnormal cells, that they're caused by an infection that is passed on by sexual activity. And of course, this message that people have a sexually transmitted infection is deeply alarming to women as well as shameful. Um, also leading to feelings of resentment that they are the ones that have to face this problem. And in a study following this shift of emphasis in terms of the script in the clinical um, case, uh, Waller et al. explored feelings of stigma and shame in relation to knowledge of HPV and its transmission. And they found that women who were aware that HPV was sexually transmitted experienced higher levels of shame, stigma, and anxiety than women who were not aware. But it would clearly be wrong not to give this information. But it's important by doing it point out the almost uh, universal prevalence of HPV around human genitalia. It's just the luck of the draw, whether you get infection with the subtype that causes cervical cancer. So that's a very important message, but sometimes it doesn't get heard. So the, shift, the influence of shifting clinical understandings, definitions and fashions has profoundly affected women's experience of the menopause as well. And I'm going to move on in the second part of this paper to examine this, starting with ideas that generated the development and use of HRT in the 1960s. Now, I think you probably, people know what the menopause is, um, this period in a woman's life when reproductive activity finishes. Um, menstruation ceases, um, there's a reduction of the, the hormone estrogen and various symptoms um, may come about as a result of that, such as mood swings, vaginal dry, dryness, headaches, um, uh, possibly the relationship with osteoporosis or thinning bones, increased risk of fractures. So th there's a lot of, of um, a concern and, and in the UK just now, a lot of, of thinking about this, about how we address this. Um, but just thinking about the origins of clinical approaches to menopause, um, a paper um, significantly produced in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society in, in 1963 was the kind of outset of HRT in the form of uh, estrogen, hormone replacement therapy in the form of estrogen on its own, started to be prescribed to women with symptoms related to the menopause. And in this paper, husband and wife team, Robert and Therma Wilson declare, the unpalatable truth must be faced that all postmenopausal women are castrates. And from a practical point of view, a man other than a woman remains the man to the end. The implication being a woman does not remain a woman to the end. So this paper with its much repeated mantra that estrogen should be given from puberty to the grave was part of the US push to redefine menopause as a deficiency disease that could be cured with HRT. And Wilson was a Brooklyn gynecologist who in the 1960s led this crusade. He founded the eponymous Wilson Foundation, who in, the, um, in New York in 1963, supported by, you'll not be surprised to hear, large grants from the phar pharmaceutical industry to promote estrogens as a cure for what, for what he promoted as a deficient disease. And he published a further pa a paper in 1962 in the Journal of the American Medical Association that claimed that estrogen prevented breast and genitalial cancer. He followed this up with a book entitled Feminine Forever, advocating estrogens as a youth pill that would help to allay 26 physiological symptoms, including hot flashes, osteoporosis, vaginal atrophy, sagging and shrinking breasts, even depression and frigidity. And this last, I think, sense uh, indicates Wilson's sense of priority. He describes in the book how he helped a distressed husband who came to him for help because his wife was driving him nuts. 
prescribing estrogen therapy enabled her to resume her wifely duties. And uh, Wilson comments, in a family situation, estrogen makes women adaptable, even tempered, generally easy to live with. And he goes on, the estrogen rich woman as a rule is capable of a far more generous and satisfying sexual response than women whose femininity suffers from inadequate chemical support. So you can see Wilson's approach was widely supported across the, the medical community in the US with the language used to describe women's failing bodies becoming more and more dramatic. David Rubin wrote a best-selling book in 1969 called Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex. And he says in this, as estrogen is shut off, a woman becomes as close as she can to being a man. Increased facial hair, deepened voice, obesity, decline of breasts and female genitalia all contribute to a masculine appearance. appearance. Not really a man, but no longer a functional woman. These individuals live in a world of intersex. Having outlived their ovaries, they've outlived their usefulness as human beings. So with this threat, it's no wonder that women started to use HRT in increasing numbers, encouraged also by advertising pitched at male doctors and husbands. So you'll see some of this. Now she can cook breakfast again if she takes HRT. Uh, and you'll see from the, the, the appearance here, you know, here's a woman who's able to kind of involve, get involved in some of her husband's um, entertaining for business. Um, help keep her this way because we want her to be a bit like that. A husband's too like Primarin. So this is the kind of way in which this stuff was being um, pitched. And the late 1970s was an all time high in the US for the prescription of estrogen, with one study suggesting that over half of postmenopausal women in Washington state had used it for at least a period of three months. So Wilson's propaganda worked. Now, these developments had significant influence in the UK, where HRT became um, available for the first time in 1965. Usage was supported by suggestions that not only did it prevent postmenopausal bone loss and relieve the symptoms of the menopause, it also has a protective effect on cardiovascular disease. And by the late 1990s, the Million Women Study reported that 33% of women were current users and 50% had used HRT at some point. Now, this was a, a high point in HRT usage, as in 2002, the US Women's Health Initiative study and in 2003, the UK William, Million Women study published findings that indicate in their very large prospective cohorts of women that combined HRT, that, that was estrogen combined with progestogen, led to a small increased risk of breast cancer. Thereafter, rates of prescription of HRT had fallen by 50% by the end of the 2010s in the UK. Now, this is, this is a very you know, clearly shifting um, context. Um, uh, and I'll just I'll kind of shift on, not sort of because the, 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 these studies have been subsequently found to be more focused on older women with other concurrent problems. And that's partly why the increased risk was present. So there's been a real kind of controversy about this. But actually now um, in, the, in the UK in the last while, partly for reasons that I'll come on to explain, they, there has been a massive uplift in requests for prescription of HRT um, because of the high profile that HRT is now having as a good treatment for menopausal symptoms rather than the prescription of, of antidepressants that a lot of GPs are tending to be offering. So I've gone through this in a little bit of detail because it's uh, this is just actually just this last week there's a shortage of HRT prescriptions because um, they have uh, the requests have gone up so much and we're having struggling to be able to provide it for women who want it. Um, actually, one woman on the radio the other morning was just was comparing it with uh, um, with diabetes medication with insulin actually as something that women actually needed to be able to function. So I've gone through this in a bit of detail because it's so fascinating, but also because of the critical influence of the history, ha this history has on women's feelings about an approach to dealing with the menopause. The language used by male doctors who developed HRT is deeply offensive to modern sensibility. And as Maria Benjamin writes in her 2006 book, The Middle Pause, 
um, a, you know, uh, is a personal history of her own menopause when she turned uh, 50. For me, the biggest hurdle in taking estrogen was reckoning with the treatment's desperately misogynistic roots. I felt besmirched by that history, as if by starting a hormone replacement regime, I had aligned myself against all women and acceded to the instrumental machinations of the male gynecological establishment. So she was very against that, despite suffering symptoms. She didn't want to go down that line. And this dilemma is highlighted by Time magazine issue from 1995. The 1960s and 70s language is extraordinary to our contemporary sensibilities in a Me Too uh, era, but resonances still exist in the clinical literature in more subtle ways. Naland and Lyons examined currently used textbooks in their medical school for the language used of postmenopausal women's bodies and noticed a preponderance of words suggesting failure atrophy, thinning, burnout, weakened. The suggestion is that the menopausal woman's body is in stark contrast to the fully developed younger body, in some way abnormal, deformed, or not fully functioning. This language is part of the clinical way of speaking about the menopause, and it has its origins in Wilson's notion of a deficiency disease, and it continues to influence women's lives. So, and this deficit view of women's aging bodies has got a very long history in medicine. In the earlier part of the 20th century, the distinguished gynecologist Mary Charlie described the physical changes that take place in women at the menopause. There's a tendency, she says, in many old women to the nutcracker type of face. The point of the chin and the tip of the nose tending to come together. So you'll recognize that from the kind of witch in, in um, in, in, in Snow White, the witch or hag, this is, what, this is what she's talking about. And in writing of the so-called moral change that, that is undertaken at this type, Charlie notes, it's probably affection and philanthropy are as active as ever. She also maintains that some women exhibit a degree of inappropriate sexual appetite at this time of life. Something she puts down to a quasi insane desire to prolong sexual life or bear children. These views about women in the association of appearance with de degeneracy, both physical and moral, the sense that their bodies are not their own to enjoy, the shamefulness of still enjoying sex in older age, the appropriateness of waning sexual desire replaced by usefulness to society, a view that also represents Charlie's um, audience that she was imagining in her writings. This throws a long cultural shadow and contributes to the shame that older women I saw in my clinic were exhibiting. And it's only in recent years that have begun to be moves to counteract these approaches and bring about a new way of thinking about the menopause, led largely by activism by the women themselves. So in this final section, I want to just explore some of these ideas. And um, some of it's been kicked off by female journalists in, in the UK, um, probably in other countries as well, but I haven't the chance to have a look at that. Kirsty Wark, for example, is a Scottish journalist who, um, who leads on, on the programme Newsnight on, on, on BBC Two. Um, she, she was the first to produce a, a documentary on her own experience of the menopause and wants to shift. It's like this kind of sense, this self-concept idea we've been talking about, wants to make a shift in terms of well, what does this mean to be at this stage? Um, she wants to talk about um, a, a shift from, um, to, from the menopause to the change, um, a time of life shift, and not, not a feature of aging, but of midlife. She wants to speak of the prime of life. Um, and medical responses that she's experienced, GPs don't understand, they offer antidepressants rather than HRT. And the exchange that um, in her documentary, I think reflects something of this opposing sense of how to think about the menopause as a natural phenomena that's about a period in women's life to be more constructively described as a prime rather than in terms of decline or aging, but also the medical profession in some way failing women by not stepping up and providing treatment for what is a natural um, uh, time. And work reflects the perspective of women who no longer want to feel ashamed about aging, who have spent their lives feeling able to be self-actualizing, are not prepared to put up with being brushed off with antidepressants. And in making this move, work is seeking to break out of what Sandra Lee Barclay regards, regards shame um, as, as a form of political oppression. Barclay sees shame in women as a mark and token of powerlessness. Dolezal, Luna notes in, in her book, the, the long association 
sociologically, historically, and philosophically between women's shame and the body. And Bartley um, notes the generalized condition of dishonor that a woman's lot in society. And, and nowhere has that been more acute than in the clinical context. I've noticed women's reproductive experiences, uh, unlike those of men, um, more often bring them into connection with the clinic and the language and culture of the clinic has in the past been characterized by what I've described as misogyny, blaming, marginalizing for perceived sexual intemperance and marginalizing, ignoring older women for their ugliness and decline. So what work uh, here and others have been attempting to do is to reconceptualize and rescue this period in women's life from one of decline, anxiety and loss to one of freedom, progress and fun. And I think this work, this has also been reflected in the work of, of writer Jimmy Greer, um, who wrote in a book called The Change in 1991. And she seeks here neither to trivialize nor medicalize the menopause, but strives to present other role models for the aging woman, to assert that to pass over the mountaintop, she says, into this new phase of life is to acquire serenity and power. She stresses the freedom from having to conform to society's image of an attractive woman by spending time preparing the imitation body with makeup, breast enhancement, etc. She even suggests HRT could be seen as part of this, as striving to maintain an earlier hormonal state that should now be rejected for a new way of being. So she describes, well, I wonder if I should go into this time-wise is a little bit shrewd, but she talks about emotional conditions that in the Western world characterize women at this time of their lives. And she talks about misery and grief, and she feels the former has no useful function, um, uh, but is, is, it, 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 she, she wants to kind of shift from that sense of that. But the, the grief in a sense is, is, is something that could potentially be um, useful. And she quotes, um, Simone de Beauvoir in, uh, in The Second Sex, who, and Simone de Beauvoir uh, talks about this. Um, long before the eventual mutilation um, of the menopause, woman is haunted by the horror of growing old. She's gambled much more heavily than the man on the sexual values she possesses to hold her husband and assure herself as a protection. It is necessary for her to be attractive, to please. What is to become of her when she no longer has any hold on him? This is what she asks herself as she helplessly looks on at the generation of this fleshly object that she identifies within herself. So like Greer, de Beauvoir concludes that middle age might bring at last some freedom from this slavery to sex, but, that, that, but that to her that freedom comes too late. Woman escapes from slavery only at times when she loses all uh, effectiveness. Um, so Greer, respond, Greer respects, responds to misery is rejecting it as, as, as futile. Stop willful striving after return to youthfulness, but enjoy this new state, having traveled through the productive uh, state of sorrow for what is lost. But she looks in vain for positive images for this new state, but does interestingly quote um, the age old trope of the witch which generally has negative connotations in Western societies, but for Karen Blixen, and we're in Karen Blixen Platz here, which is interesting, who reflect, reflects on her knowledge of African women, there were consolations. And Karen Blixen says in actually a speech to a Danish female audience in, in 1937, she says, all old women had the consolation of witchcraft. The relations of witchcraft were comparable to their relations with the act of seduction. One cannot understand how we, who will have nothing to do with witchcraft, can bear to grow old and lose our power. Um, so Greer invokes in her call to embrace this period of life is, is the sense of freedom from having to be noticed, to feel that everything and everyone relates to you. We've talked a little bit about this. So she says, when you're young, everything's about you. As you grow older, you are pushed to the margin. You begin to realize that everything is not about you. And that is the beginning of freedom. And this call is echoed by Maria Benjamin in her book. In middle age, I'm discovering, she says, that I care less about what other people think. I care less about material things too, and about acquisition more generally. I'm less hungry and more content. Gradually, I am shedding, shedding ballast and gaining buoyancy. I really like that notion of, of buoyancy. And I was going to go through a little bit um, 
of Margaret Locke's book, which is obviously a very famous book on, um, on cross-cultural comparisons of the menopause of women in, um, between the US and Japan. And Margaret Locke speaks of a different sort of experience um, of women at this stage in life where, where the, the looking after the elder, the family and the older parent is a very much a, a part of, the, of what that um, life um, entails. But also Locke, I think, reveals in her, in her book um, a sense that there's a kind of shift even within Japanese society, um, which is reflected, I think, in this, um, in this cartoon. Um, is that there's an emergent, um, but still elusive feminist consciousness, um, uh, which um, that, that, that women are actually finding this, this sense of the need to be the ones that are the, looking after the elderly parents rather um, uh, oppressive. As this work is at rather a preliminary stage, I've not really been able to follow up and see whether um, since Locke wrote this book, which was at the same time as Greer's book in the 1990s, there's any change as a result of that emergent consciousness. But the implications I think of Locke's work for uh, uh, the, the activist agenda that's beginning to emerge is that, that if we're to strive to influence um, uh, uh, the prevailing cultural context and attitudes towards older women and the menopause there will not only be benefits to the attitudes towards women, but biological responses might in turn be transformed because of that relationship between the cultural expectations and ideas and how people's symptomatology um, uh, is, 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 is experienced, I think. So that's very interesting. Um, so from Locke's work, there's clear that the conclusion is that the perceptions of the menopausal woman as not a real woman, as deficient, as abnormal, withered and aging, should not be regarded as static or pervasive. In North American, public attention con concentrates almost exclusively on individual biology and sets up the aging female as a target for medicalization. And Locke notes that a few politically motivated groups and individuals some dedicated to meticulous research, others to the wide dissemination of knowledge, mobilize public consciousness to ensure that the long-term medication of older women does not become the natural order of things. So we're kind of moving, I think, to, through this sense of wanting to reject shame, to reject the shame of the menopause into a new conception and sense of self around the menopause that's been fronted, I think, hugely by um, by uh, these high profile women journalists at the moment. So we've had Kirsty Wark, we've had Jeanette Winterson, the writer, um, uh, uh, writing about, about this, that they're all talking about their own experiences, revealing huge challenges for women who, as Wark declares, are not aging, but in the prime of life. This is a time when women are at their most involved in life and in society, setting children on their next stage, supporting older parents, sure, but also very often in this particular, I realize this particular societal area, kind of middle class, high achieving, peak of their careers, striving to be the breadwinner within a socioeconomic context where that role for men is beginning to decline. So there is this high profile noise, but there's also an evidence of outpouring of self-help sites, um, for instance, Mumsnet um, uh, and the website Hot Flush, which is a, um, another one, um, and A Menopause Matters, which set up by a, a, a Dr. Heather Curry and other UK clinicians, um, and menopause support sites. Quite a few um, sites um, that have been produced to try to support women to get together to talk about this experience. This is a move to, um, to enable people to feel more, uh, su more supported about talking about the problem, um, particularly in relation to the workplace. Um, this age group of women are becoming significantly economically important um, in society now. Many more women of this particular age group are, are at working, are working than used to be, say, two, three decades ago. ago. So workplaces are having now, and our university is one such, to, to create policies to support women who've got menopausal problems in the same way as they have for people, women of reproductive age. So I think uh, this is really important, and you can see the kind of stats on, on, um, on the, the women of working age who experience uh, menopausal symptoms. So I think just in conclusion, um, 
the challenge to throw off the shame of menopause is part of a wider movement reflected in Me Too, equal pay, glass ceiling debates, and also the call to be more open about women's other women's health issues. Um, and I'm speculating also reflects the maturing of a generation of women who are used to being heard to equality with men, to being self-actualizing and having reached the menopause, they're alarmed to discover how it is viewed, ignored and unsupported, how badly it affects their ability to function in the home and at work. And there are signs that this is changing, but the long cultural shadow that I've outlined in a little bit of detail will be difficult to escape involving, as it does, a major reconceptualization of the status and value of older women. And I think just finally, as Deborah, Deborah Lupton um, suggests, towards wanting to see menopause as a period when women are uplifted to a process of self-discovery, a catalyst for change and personal growth, a time in which women are released from the bodily imperatives of reproduction and active sexuality. Thank you very much, everyone. Much, Jen. Um, I think we're open for questions. Uh, we've got a question from TV for Jay. With the close correlation between identity and clinical examination on reproductive health, I wonder if you thought about how this might be extended to queer, non binary, or trans people when there is another layer of identity in relationship to body. Sure. Or have you come across any studies? Yeah, well, that's Phoebe, thanks for that question. I, in my abstract, but I didn't reiterate it at the outset of my talk, I, I should really have, have mentioned that I'm particularly um, referring to, to cisgender females in this talk. And I'm well aware that there are, um, you know, other identities and particularly trans women. And I have certainly looked after uh, trans women undergoing um, gender reassignment. Um, and I think, again, that is something that, um, I mean, I came across one woman uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a standard gynecological ward where it was, it was very difficult for this, this person to, to be there as the kind of sole person undergoing this particular procedure. So um, I think that requires a very specific orientation and, um, because these these women will be kind of included in that sense of you know what what happens in relation to to the aging process and the the shift in, in hormones that take place at that point but i'm insufficiently well informed to be able to say anything about that but i'm well aware it's a it's a really important point to make um but i've avoided kind of going down that line in this particular talk Thank you, Jane. Um, so with, as you started presenting on one hand, um, in the beginning, I was looking at how women, especially like six gender women, like occupying, like especially the redefining our relationship with the sexuality or sacred especially in the patriarchal you know settings where you need to embrace pleasure and the discussion of pleasure is lacking much more. Uh, but as you uh, going further and then this end which I also was thinking especially with an Indian context sometimes menopause I mean when I do engage with my mother or like many of my aunts menopause is also freedom for them I mean in this the creation is also that uh, especially in certain settings where there's an oppression especially on women's bodies so do you have any thoughts around these like extremes in different ways thank you yes I, I yeah thanks very much for that I I am um... I think I'm now located in an anthropology department. So um, in terms of my exploration of this point, I think that um, and, and India is one country where I thought exploring this might be very useful because it is very different. Of course, we've got we've got significant populations of people um, of South Asian or origin in the UK to explore this with them. And my sense actually is interestingly that um, again biologically the experience of the menopause is slightly different to some of these groups and that may be because of perceptions of their importance within their family context I don't know but I think that that's a really important point and I do think that um, 
I think that there's some very interesting elements to the kind of freedom notion and the pleasure notion, because one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this phase in life is the shift that it brings about from a kind of um, from a, an experience of the body that is related to, um, to a cyclical experience. So that, you know, women, we, we go through our reproductive lives constantly kind of possibly at the beck and call of how our hormones make us feel from moment to moment throughout a month, if, if you have a regular cycle. And then you're released from that into the freedom of kind of um, a sustained sense of possible kind of um, evenness of temper, if you're lucky enough for that. Um, so the, I, think there's a, I think there's a bit of work that needs to be done, you're quite right, on, on the pleasures inherent in that time of life. And obviously Greer is talking about the need not to be noticed. Um, but um, I think I think the kind of freedom from certain kinds of responsibilities, the, the freedom from a need to prove yourself as a, a woman in particular kinds of ways. And I think the kinds of things that we need to start to address and that it's becoming more possible to address, I think partly because of women's importance in the economic context and actually in some ways, sadly, because of, of men in particular part of society, they are declining importance, I think, particularly for, because of the disappearance of, in, of, in, of certain industries. Um, so there's a kind of a feeling that women's importance is, is increasing within society. And I think there is a, there's something to be celebrated in that, though hopefully not at the expense of men. But I think, I think you're quite right. It would be really good to look at, at what that all means across different groups of women with different cultural contexts. Mm. Yeah. I thank you so much. Uh, it was super interesting and horrifying. <laughs> okay, so I, I had a question. Um, or so I, I find these narratives uh, by Greer and Lapton of you know free free yourself from these bodily imperatives really useful and um, you know uh, motivating, <laughs> but I also sometimes worry a bit about them because I'm thinking, for example, of um, Ian Hacking's notion of interactive kinds. This idea we are not indifferent to the way we are described, we respond, we we either adapt to those narratives or we reject them explicitly. So I am a bit worried when I hear this uh, really being released from the bodily imperatives of reproduction and active sexuality, because it makes me feel as a woman, you know, at that point that I am supposed not to be actively sexu sexually active anymore. So it kind of imposes a, a, um, another norm, which I might not want to, uh, or I might not experience, or I might not want to correspond to. So yeah, this, replacing one narrative with the other still has some some risks um so i don't wonder what you think about that no, I, I quite agree i think i think um if i one of the things i would like to do with this work because i've never I've published any of it or kind of thought that far far about it yet but i think in in parallel with your notion about sexual activity and 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 kind of the sense that we're past it, we're past sort of sex, we're past, past bothering about that, because it strikes me, I mean, Mary Char Charlie's kind of points are really quite interesting, because I think, I think that there is something about the freedom of this period of life that can make um, sexual activity even more satisfying and, um, and free and fun, um, uh, um, uh, and partly because of the, a certain degree of confidence as well as freedom. But I think this is an interesting, that's an interesting element of the kind of sets of binaries um, that are around, you know, which, which are not mutually exclusive. So one of the arguments I want to make through this is that on the one hand, there is this, this misogynistic history, which we want to reject in relation to medicalization and HRT and all the rest of it. But on the other hand, it's an extraordinary valuable treatment and it can transform women's lives at this stage. And, and so there's been this real trouble over the, over the last couple of decades about GPs, certainly in the UK, becoming um, uh, increasingly um, uh, um, uninformed about 
how to prescribe HRT, the benefits of HRT, so that if any woman of this age goes and sort of says, well, I've got psychological symptoms in relation to the menopause, they will avoid prescribing it. They will go on to something else. And so there's a kind of lack of expertise has, has now happened in relation to that. And, and so on the one hand, women want to establish this sense that it's normal, but on the other hand, actually, sometimes I suffer from these grim um, symptoms that have been bad enough in some women's cases to actually give up their jobs because they simply cannot cope because the psychological symptoms very often are so bad that they have no confidence and all this kind of thing happens. So I think we are dealing with some interesting sort of binaries here. And that's why I think that we, we talked a bit about activist agendas. I think Phil's, Phil's paper yesterday in relation to um, HIV. And I think Karsten, um, uh, who, who was talking uh, um, as well about sort of activist agendas. And I think one of the interesting things about menopause is that there's a there's a sort of I mean, the the what's the object object of the activist agenda? It's not to reject the kind of medicalization or the or the the, the sense that there's a, that the, there may be need for treatment for the menopause, but it's to uphold the sense that that um, that it's something we need to that everybody needs to be more aware of has a significant influence and that women um, don't want to be kind of oppressed by it at this stage in their life. So there's a lot of very interesting themes here, I think, to explore. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jane, for that really interesting <clears throat> discussion. One of the things I was thinking about, which I think I've spoken to you about before, is like women presenting for exams in gynecological settings, sort of inherently shameful, or women come embarrassed to reveal what's down there, or, and then there's the added shame of, I loved what you said of their sexual activity being kind of written onto their bodies. But the, the thing that always interests me is whether medical professionals are trained to manage those dynamics and those emotional responses, which seem kind of inevitable in, in a gynecological setting, if not inevitable, then highly likely. And in your experience being trained as a doctor, in your experience teaching in medical schools, are those self-conscious feelings kind of talked about, managed, or any are students trained to have any strategies to help mitigate the, I guess, the harm that might come from them? Yes. Um, I think um, I, when I retrained to, to, to do the corposcopy, um, we, um, I had to go through an exam, which was very embarrassing um, at quite a late stage in my career. And, um, but one of the things that was really significantly missing from, and I remember the kinds of exams I had to do as a GP in training, was that um, was that sense of you know how do you talk to women about this problem, and that was quite that was quite significant. We you know we had to learn up all the information, the knowledge. So that's interesting that that was neglected there. I think within the context of medical schools, well, my experience, and I know that we had a bit of a discussion about this yesterday, is that we are getting we were getting better at um, at. Um, supporting students to talk about some stressful, difficult situations, but not about sex. So when it comes to the highly sensitive context of, of sexual activity, of um, how people, um, you know, uh, have, you know, respond to problems related to that, or as, as you say, how it's written on the body, there, there's really we're not addressing that mm -hmm. and I think that is a that is a major a major difficulty because I think the the key thing that came through in the paper that I quoted from again about um, women's lives after reproductive cancer treatment um, is that we is that we're completely ignoring a huge element of what we, what makes life meaningful for people and gives them their identity and I mean, I think that I think that again actually just follows on from a societal reluctance to talk more openly about these things. And in a sense, of things like menopause and 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 having babies and all that, it's kind of easier to talk about. In almost easier to talk about that, but to talk about how it is you can have sex when you've had surgery down there 
is a very difficult thing to do. And also because I think, I think partly because the medical profession, we are trained to, be, to offer solutions, to say, well, here's a thing you could take, this is something you could do that will make it better. Actually, that's not what we're being called upon to do in these situations. What we're being called upon to do is to, is to raise it, is to say to women, how's your sexual life? How's your sex life? You know, and the minute you say that, women will feel, oh God, it's, it's okay, I can do that. I can still have that part of my life. It's, it's okay, it's acceptable. Um, it may be difficult, you know, and then just open out a conversation about that. And I think we need to be able to do that more with our, with our students. I'm not really in that position anymore with students, but, but I think we, we in, in the kind of field of medical humanities and as much as it's still a medical education element, yeah, we talk much more about em empathy with patients, all the rest of it, but we're not talking about particular circumstances that may be specifically difficult, except for palliative care, cancer care, which is a big issue. But this one is a no-go area still, I think. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mary, but as, as the mic's being passed to Mary a little bit, yep. uh, I'll just read out this comment from Amanda. It's one of the best this comment. Absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you. I work in breast care. I often come across women who feel intense shame when they have undergone surgical treatment to their breasts. The struggle with the shame of being, quote, effective regarding their sexual attractiveness and womanliness. Quote and their position in society. I work with them often centers on this. I can't be talked to those expanded my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Amanda. That, that's really, really good to hear. And I think that's another really significant area where women with breast surgery feel in some way deformed. It's, um, I, I don't know much about the literature, but from what I've read that absolutely, it sounds like that's your experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jane, for a very clear and interesting uh, discussion and um, presentation. I wanted to bring in the subject of class because whilst, um, whilst Greer talks about acquiring serenity and power and whilst uh, you yourself said a lot of the activism at the minute is quite is based on cis uh, and middle, white middle class women but also the that um, poorer women um, in the UK and elsewise across the workplace might not have the same choices and may indeed um, have more shameful encounters as a result. Yeah, thanks Mary for raising that. I think that's really, really important. Um, I've, I've, um, I've um, recently, um, well, the last couple of years, I, I, along with a professional services um, colleague in the university set up a women's um, network Mary's been heavily involved in um, and we we had a, a session on on menopause and I realized um, that I mean this was kind of during well this was actually just before lockdown um, and I realized in that that in that women's network that um, if we um, if we advertise things through um, email and all the rest of it and um, had things lunchtime meetings we would be excluding a huge um, cohort of women employed at the university who worked between six and nine and perhaps between um, five and eight doing the cleaning and all these kinds of things. So we, we instituted breakfast, a breakfast meeting on this subject and it was, it was fantastic. These women came along and offered their perspective, which reflected quite a lot of the, the literature that's just scraping the surface of this. But most of the work done on um, working women with menopause has been done on professional women who spend their lives in offices sat in front of computers. And so there's issues like opening a window if you've got a hot flush, um, you know, the psychological issues about comments. But for the women who are doing cleaning and, and, and the other activities around, around uh, the workplace, um, having cotton uniforms is really important than having mixed um, uh, mixed cloth uniforms with polyester in them because they sweat more. Um, the, the musculoskeletal symptoms that Margaret Locke talked about the women in Japan having uh, were much more prominent because of the experiences they have of having to undertake manual work. And um, I think so we've got yes we have got this 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 cohort of women exemplified by these journalists who um talk about the, the sense of being in the, in the prime of life 
for many of these women, it's not, it's not like that. They're very often, they are the breadwinner. They're often juggling grandchildren, um, adult children at home, unemployed, husbands who maybe aren't working so much. Um, they're, they're, they have very complex, they're maybe having to hold down several jobs. So, so lives for these women are not like that. Um, and so we need to be very cognizant. And I think more work definitely needs to be done on women in that area of society um, who are less able, I think, to connect with this narrative, this self-concept that is now coming out about what women in the menopause should be feeling like. And then there could potentially be more shape. Well, I don't feel like that. I don't feel as if I'm in the prime of life. I feel really quite kind of exhausted and ground down by the particular circumstances of women in my age in this part of society. So it's a very, very big one. Thank you. Uh, there's, time, there's about a minute left, and there's one question here, which um, you can answer, to, we can try to answer maybe later. But um, Julia Wright, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. My question is about women who are forced to go through menopause for health reasons oh, yeah. with different stages in their lives, such as during their 20s or 30s. Do you think this kind of shame is similar to women going through menopause in their 40s or 50s? Well, a brief answer. Thanks, Julia. And, and it's really, really important. Actually, I was I was admonished slightly in, in our in our women at DU network for maybe not sufficiently acknowledging the fact that that women um, at very much younger ages very often experience this. And it's com that experience is compounded by the fact that they are even more invisible in society, I think. And that, that that's what you're you're suggesting. And I think and I think there are so many other issues that layer upon that, like loss of reproductive potential being one issue potentially that comes in there. Um, and that sense of being different from, from, from their peers and the shock of it um, and the sense that, you know, golly, I'm getting old before my time. I'm sure there's lots of it. I haven't done any work on this. So, but I'm well aware that that is a very different kind of experience and one that does need, does need to be fully acknowledged in the context of this, of this, um, uh, and I mean, recently I helped a, a young woman who was, was in this situation by putting her onto bioidentical HRT, which if people haven't heard about is a kind of, is, is conceived to be a more natural form of HRT, which is specifically prescribed for a woman in relation to their own hormonal um, profile. And very often, I think women feel more comfortable with that approach, um, particularly when they've got, they've got to take the HRT over a long period of time. But thanks for that point. That's really important. That um, I free you all for lunch. Thank you very much to thanks Jane.